Secondly, I offer my pranam thousands of times at the lotus feet of my Param Gurudev and to all of our Sri Rupanuga Gaudiya Guru Parampara. And finally, I offer my pranam to Ananya Tidandika Bhagavan and to all the Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis, Vanchakalta Tarukas, Kripalas and Dukhya, Kuditanam, Bhavadi, Yesterday, we were discussing about the Self, Atma. And how 
the conditioned souls in this world, their first defect is Brahm, the tendency to be illusion and two illusions are prominent, one related to misidentifying the actual self with the conventional material ego. That is the first. And the second aspect of Brahm is the illusion bewilderment in regard to the world. So the Atma is Ketragya, the know of the field. He's first confused about who am I. And then he's confused about what the field is, what is the, uh, his world of experience. So today we will continue, we'll go on to the next one, but we'll just continue to discuss a little about the nature of Atma. So, Jamatri Rishi has said, Tata Gyatritva Khatritva Bhaktritva Nija Dharamaka Paramatmaika Sheshatva Subhava Savada Svata. So the first quality of the Jiva is Gyatritva. He is a knower. A know he, he has awareness. He's not, but he's not just awareness. Jnana Matra. If were only awareness, then he could not have so many other qualities, such as being an agent, Katrattva, the doer, Bhaktrattva, the enjoyer, and the, especially yesterday we discussed how the soul is Premaspada. Who remembers what does Premaspada mean? He is the seat of love. Whatever love we have for anything, it is not because of that thing. It is because of Atma. And why is the Atma the Premaspada? Because Paramatma. Actually. So the natural object of love for everyone is not your car. <laughs> not your shoes. Not your family members even. Not even your body. To a certain degree yourself. But the cause of all affection is that the self within the self there is the Paramatma, the Supreme Self. So Sri Krishna illustrated that in his very beautiful Leela when Brahmaji tried to steal the cows and boys, cowherd boys. Then Sri Krishna expanded himself, became all the boys and all the calves. And almost one year later, after he, Krishna had been playing in this way, incognito, not recognized by anyone, even Balaram. Then one day, Krishna and he, his coward boyfriends and calves, otherwise known as Krishna, they were wandering in the valley of Govardhan. It's all Krishna. On the top of the hill, the coward men were there with their cows. But when the cows saw the calves at the bottom, even though those calves had grown and they had given birth to new calves, and the cows were supposed to be attached to the new calves, but instead they showed more attachment to the older calves. And they, the cow men tried to control them with their sticks, but they could not. And the cows came running down the hill and gave the milk to their calves. So the men, they were angry that the boys had come and brought the whole herd down the hill and now all the milk was being drunk by the older calves. And the coward men came running down the hill also to rebuke their sons. But when they got down and they saw their sons, they forgot about everything. And they just embraced them with tears in their eyes and they were sniffing their heads and they were in ecstasy. Balaram was watching all this and Balaram thought, what is this? How is it that the cows have more love 
for the older calves who have grown than for the newly born ones. This is not ordinary. And how is it that they are so, the, the coward men are showing love for their sons like they show love for Krishna? Because already they love Krishna more than their own sons in Brazil. Everyone loves Krishna more than anyone else. Hmm? How is it possible? Then Balaram, hmm, by the uh, wish of Sri Krishna, Yoga Maya, which had covered Balaram's knowledge, uncovered him. And then he realized, Oh, Kanaya, all these boys and all these calves, they're all you. So by this pastime, actually Shukadev Goswami at that point he says, Tasmat Priyatama Swatma Sarvesham Apidehinam Tadartam Eva Sakalam Jagat Eitach Characharam. The meaning is it is only for the satisfaction of the self that a person is living and his true object of love to which he's really attached is the self of the self the Lord within the heart so yesterday we discussed the subject of Gyatratva, how the soul is a knower. He is Swasmai Swayam Prakash. Quick test, what does it mean? Swasmai Swayam Prakash. Raise your hand. Yes. Uh, it means that um, he's able to illuminate himself. He has self-awareness. I mean, he's able to illuminate the realm, but he also has self-awareness. Uh -huh. Which part is which? What does Swayam Prakash mean? Swayam, that he illuminates the objects around. Swayam Prakash means he's self-luminous, like a candle. So the candle illuminates himself to others and illuminates other things to others. So that is Swayam Prakash. But Swasma is Swayam Prakash. Swasma means unto himself. He also is aware, a candle is not aware of himself. All the things that the candle is illuminating. So the soul is aware of himself and also aware of the things he illuminates. So yesterday, so that is called Swasmai Swayam Prakash. So when we say that the, the Jiva is Gyatritra, the Noah, then the word Gyan has three meanings. Who remembers the three meanings of Gyan? I can see you all deeply contemplated the class yesterday. <laughs> this is why, after hearing a class, then you should go and then try, it's like, you know a chipmunk, you know his mouth is full, but he didn't swallow anything. So you have to go and digest it. If you just go outside in the garden, have a pizza, laughing and joking, everything will just evaporate. Yeah? That person is not a serious student. Srotrium, hearing, means hearing and taking it into your heart. Hmm? Not in one ear and out from the other. So, who remembers? Don't we have a go? Yes. One is the uh, other city. So the first meaning of Gyan is only awareness. Mm -hmm. That is subjective awareness with no content. No content. Then the second meaning is that knowledge, the actual content which is revealed to a knowing person. Let's say if you see a tree, now you have knowledge of the tree. So that knowledge of the external object is being revealed to a subject. 
So the first one is only the subject's awareness of himself with no content and no object. Just awareness. Mayavadis take this to be the only meaning of Jnana. Hmm? Then the second one, that is the knowledge which is the content, content of knowledge which is revealed to a knower. So that is the, the object, objective knowledge, that content which is revealed to a knower. Then the third one is the substrate of consciousness. The soul is said to be knowledge, that means he is a substance which is conscious and which has the attribute of knowledge, consciousness. For example, sugar is a substance and it has the attribute of being sweet. So the Atma is a substance. What is he? Gyan. He Gyan means his consciousness. But he also has the attribute of consciousness. That is a quality that his Gyan Vritti can spread out from him and the transform into the various content of the things that he knows. Think about it carefully. It's not uh, so difficult. Just think about it carefully. The Atma, Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita, is immutable. Right? It's unchanging. Right? So if you are unchanging and you are conscious, then how can you be conscious of different things? Like now it was morning, then it was noon, then it's afternoon. So your consciousness is changing because the, the consciousness has to transform in order to accommodate the movement of its contents. Right? Understand? Just like a magnet has a power that extends beyond itself and can move iron filings. So the jiva is gyan, that means he is substance, the substance from which he is composed is gyan. He, that's the substrate. And he has the quality, the characteristic of gyan, that is gyanavriti, that his consciousness can extend beyond himself and can the transform to accommodate different kinds of content and relay that to the soul. Understand? So, just pure awareness, that's the first meaning. The second meaning is the content which is revealed to the soul. So the first one is the subject. The second one is knowledge in the form of objective knowledge. And the third one is the substance, the soul himself, who is the substrate for the, the, um, car the subject for the quality of knowledge, for that characteristic of knowledge. Okay, is it clear? <coughs> you understand? So the soul is immutable. Yeah, it doesn't change. So if the soul is consciousness, in order to perceive other things changing, there's something about you which will have to change. Understand? So, that is why we quoted the verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam yesterday in the 11th canto. It is said, Upalabdi Matram Sabanabit. Even though the Jiva is made of consciousness and he's unchanging, but he experiences the uh, movements of time. That means he himself as consciousness is personally unchanging. But his Gyan Riti extends and this transforms in order to transmit back to him what's going on around him. Okay? No, soul is not changing. No. Yes. Question? In connection with the analogy of sugar, so what is the third level of sugar awareness? Uh, well, the analogy does not extend fully because the sugar has no consciousness. <laughs> this can only be applied to the subject of, of consciousness. The analogy of the sugar, or the uh, analogy of the uh, the analogy of the sugar, was to show there's a difference between a substrate and its attribute. Right? The substrate of sweetness is the sugar, and its attribute is sweetness. So similarly, the third meaning of gyan is the substrate 
the soul is consciousness as a substrate and it also has the attribute of consciousness which can extend from itself and transform uh, into um, to uh, relay the objects to the subject because the objects are changing the subject is not changing right? but the objects are changing so this is important to understand because the soul is unchanging but its attribute Jnana in the form of its attribute consciousness Jnana Vritti extends from the soul into the Chitta and there in the Chitta there is a darkened portion of Chitta which is filled with many many samskars, impressions it is a classic portion of the Chitta filled with impressions and what is that? Ahankar Ego so, Swapsam Maham Avasam Sukha Maham Avasam Nakinchita Vedisam when you're asleep, then you, the ego is dissolved. But when you wake up, then the ego is activated again. So in the waking state, the soul which has ahankar, its own I-ness, its jnana extends onto the I-ness of the material ego. And now he is identifying with that. Hmm? He's identifying with that. Why? Because that material ego facilitates his bog, enjoyment of material existence. So we are actively identifying with the material ego. Hmm? And this is an offense to the holy name. Ahamma Madi Parmo Nami Sopya Parada Krit. Once by hearing from Sri Guru about the glory of the holy name and all the tattvas, jiva tattva, maya tattva, all these things. If a person will maintain his self-identity within the external ego, hmm? now he is making an offense to the Holy Name. You have to stop that. It's offense to the Holy Name. Hmm? Why are we chanting and spacing out and being inattentive? Because we kept our identity in the conventional material ego. And it is so many samskars and from that all desires and thoughts are coming. So if one is chanting the holy name, but remaining in that state of identification with the material ego, this is the tenth offense to the holy name. So, then Nam will not manifest this beautiful form and qualities and pastimes. So yesterday we discussed Gyatrektva. Now, we're coming to the next aspect of the Jiva. Katrektva. He is an agent, a doer. That means he is the initiator of activities. Hmm? Now in Bhagavad Gita, as you know, there Krishna said, Prakrite kriyamanani gunae karmani sarvasaha hankara vimudatma karta amite manyate The spirit soul, bewildered by the influence of a hankar, false ego, he thinks himself the karta, the doer of activities which are actually carried out by the three gunas, the qualities of prakriti, the material energy. Now one may say, well here Krishna said that the jiva is not the doer. But you are saying, or rather Jamatri Rishi is saying, Katritva, the jiva is the doer. So what is the answer? Is the jiva the doer? or not the do. Now generally our acharyas, because we are following the Vedanta, Vedanta Sutra of Vyasadeva and Srimad Bhagavatam is the explanation of Vedanta Sutra. And in Vedanta Sutra it is four chapters and in the second chapter there is a comparison between Vedanta and the Sat Darshans the six classical systems of Vedic philosophy. There's also a comparison with the uh, materialism of Charvak Muni and also Jainism and also four types of Buddhism. But essentially, in the second chapter, the conclusions of Vedanta are established by comparing and contrasting them with all these other alternatives. Understand? So now, in Sankhya Darshan, they say that yes, 
the jiva, the soul, is conscious. And he's an individual. And there are multiplicity of jivas. But the jiva is not the doer. Only when he's in contact with Prakriti, the material energy, now Prakriti is doing everything. But the jiva is not karta. And this is why Jamati Rishi is saying, no, kartritta. The jiva is an agent. Now, a person who follows Sankhya philosophy could say, this verse of Bhagavad Gita, ahankara vimudatva karta amiti manyate. If someone thinks he is a doer, then vimudatva. He's bewildered by ahankar, by false ego. Someone may say this. So in reply, we say no. Actually this verse does not say that the jiva does not have kartritta, agency. That's not what the verse says. It says that he thinks that he is the agent of the activities which are done by prakriti. There's a difference. Is it clear? Yeah? First of all, kātam iti manyate, the soul thinks. That's also an activity. So the verse itself says that the Atma is, has cultured to agency, is doer. Because he's considering. Manyate, he's considering, he's thinking. I am the doer. So that's why I was saying, when you identify with the ego, that's an activity. Uh, and you're doing it here. But instead of thinking, I am the Atma, hmm, who can act through desiring, he thinks, I am doing the activities which are performed by the physical body and senses. Like that. So this verse does not say that the Atma is not the doer. It says he's not the doer of the activities that Prakriti is doing, the material energy. Is it, is it clear? So, yes. He's the doer of placing his self-identity in the material ego. He's doing that. Kartaham iti manyate. He's thinking, he's considering. Oh, I am that thing which is actually not him. But now he's identifying with that, now Prakriti is doing everything. Now, in Vedanta Sutra 2.3.31, 2.3.31 Vedanta Sutra, it is said, Karta Shastra Tvat Tvat, means the Jiva is a Karta, he is a doer. Why? Because of Shastra Arta, the meaning of the scripture. So this means that the scripture would have no meaning if the jiva were not the karta, the doer. Hmm? Because the material energy prakriti is dead. It is jad, it is inert. So if the scripture were talking to the, to the physical energy saying, don't do this, don't do that, then what's the point? Hmm? And if the scripture is saying to the, to the soul, don't do this, but the soul is not the doer, then what's the point? Understand? Scripture says, Dharmachara, perform your duties. Satyavada, Satyamvada, speak the truth. But if, if the soul, which is consciousness, is not the doer, then to whom is the scriptures giving the instruction to do things? And if the doership is only with the material energy, material energy is dead, it has no consciousness. So why is Veda talking to him? <coughs> also, in the Shastra, it will say things like, let the person who desires to enjoy heaven perform sacrifice. So if the person it's telling to perform the sacrifice were not the same person who would enjoy the fruit of that sacrifice, then the Vedas would have no meaning. So in all of these ways, uh, it is as the, the Vedanta Sutra is saying, Karta Shastra Tattvat, the uh, Jiva is Karta, he is an agent. Otherwise, the instructions of the scriptures would have no meaning. So, now, the question is, if the Jiva is Karta, does he have free will to act. 
This is a very big problem that people face. They think that, oh, the world is full of suffering. So there cannot be a God, because if there's a God, then He should be good. Mm -hmm. And the world is full of suffering. So if there is a God, then He's allowing all this suffering to happen. Mm -hmm. So He cannot be good. Why would God just make everyone suffering in this world? So I don't believe in God because there cannot be a conscious, loving, kind, supreme, all-powerful person that is irreconcilable with a world full of people suffering. So then people tend to say, oh, there's no God. Otherwise, if they accept there is a God, then it's very difficult for them to reconcile this phenomena of innocent suffering, that innocent people are suffering. Very hard for them to reconcile. So then, the mm, certain religions come forward with a solution. And they say, well, it's not God's fault that people are suffering. People are suffering because it's their own karma. Mm -hmm. So there's no such thing as innocent suffering. Because if anyone is suffering, then it's because they have done something themselves and it has come back to them. So don't make God responsible for your suffering. The individual is responsible for his suffering because of karma. Then the person gets into another conundrum. Wait a minute, if everything is just going on according to our karma, then that is everything is predetermined. There's predestination. It's fatalistic. There's no free will. We're just stuck in this endless chain of karma. Hmm? So these are, I'm giving some examples of when an ordinary person tries to understand life. At every step, they just find themselves in another conundrum. Another puzzle that they cannot solve by themselves. Hmm? It's very, the Maya is very dangling web. So, we have to uh, solve this puzzle. So the scripture tells us, gives answer to the question, do we have free will, independence or not? And the answer is, yes and no. <laughs> It's a little bit uh, nuanced, let us say. The material energy is under the control of the Supreme Lord. Nothing can move without His permission. And the spiritual energy is also under the control of the Supreme Lord or serving Him according to His will. And the Jiva, Tatastha Shakti, can be under one energy or another. So wherever He is, He's always under the will of the Lord. But His will is which energy He will be under. You see? So the, the Jiva has a choice. He has will, but it is not... Uh, he has his own free will, but it cannot be always fully expressed in the conditioned state. So we'll elaborate on that more. So first of all, the spiritual energy is acting according to the will of the Lord. The material energy is always also acting according to the will of the Lord. And the jiva has within him the free will to decide, should I go this way, in Maya, or this way, in the shelter of Krishna's lotus feet. Okay. Now, let's consider the situation of the jiva who is in this material world. He also has some free will, but it's conditioned. It's very conditioned. According to the degree to which he's in ignorance, uh, then, to that degree, he will be control, fully controlled by the gunas or he will have some choice to 
ra uh, raise the standard of his life and consciousness towards Sattva. So, in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 18, text 14, Sri Krishna describes five factors of action. Adhisthanam tathakata karnam cha prithak vidam vividas cha prithak chasta daivam chaivatra panchamam. Sri Krishna explains here, for a karma, an activity to take place, five things are involved. Adhisthanam means the body your body if the soul does not have a body it cannot act either he should have a material body and through that body he can act or he should have a spiritual body and through the spiritual body he can act so if the soul hypothetically were to have no body then his uh, qualities of Kartritva and Bhaktritva being the doer and the enjoyer, there would only be potentially in him. There would be a potential. And when he has a material body, he can manifest his doership and his enjoyership. Or if he has a spiritual body, he can manifest his doership or enjoyership. As far as Gyatritva is concerned, without a body, if the Jeeva is in Brahman, then he can only experience subjective awareness with no contents, the first meaning of jnana. But to experience the, uh, the other two, then oh, he will need either a material body or a, a spiritual body. Okay. So now, so the first thing is, adhisthanam, the first factor of action is adhisthanam, that means the place, and in this context it means having a physical body. Then, tata karta. The next factor of action is karta. Now karta generally means the doer. But in this context, it means the ahankar, the material ego, which has been invested with karta, with doership and consciousness from the soul. Without the presence of the soul, even the ego will not do anything. So the, the soul has a spiritual ego, he has invested that into the material ego. And so here the word karta means the material ego, which is invested with consciousness and doership by the Atma. That is karta. Then the next cause, the third cause, karanam. Karanam means the senses. In order to act you need senses. So that includes also the mind. Manashastranindriyani praktistani karshati. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, Mamai vangso jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana manashastranindriyani prakriti stani karshati. It's very deep. First, Krishna said, The jiva is my eternal separated. Part, Angsa, Vivin Angsa. Then in the second part he says, and he is Prakritistani Karshati, being situated in the material energy Prakriti, Karshatri, he draws towards himself Mana Shastrani Triani, the six senses. That means the mind plus the power of hearing, touching, seeing, tasting and, and smelling. This this five. So, here also Krishna is saying the jiva is the doer. Why? Karshati. This is the active verb. The jiva is drawing towards himself like a magnet draws the iron filings towards himself. So the jiva by his will is karshati, drawing towards himself the mind and senses. And then through those he's acting in the world. So, karanam. Hmm? Pratak Vidam. Uh, means different types. So the different types of senses. Then, Vividas Cha Pratak Cheshta. The fourth uh, factor of action is Pratak Cheshta. 
different endeavors. Here it literally means pran. Pran. Without pran you cannot move. Because pran is the original appearance of Kriya Shakti in the material energy. First there is Chitta. And then when Rajas appears, then the Chitta begins to condense and becomes the Sutta Tattva. And that is the chief pran, Mukya Pran. Then this pran moves everything. It, and it divides, it says, he says, Pritak, just a Pritak, different. It becomes pran, apan, viyan, saman, udan, five types of pran. And begins to move through the chitta and around the whole chakra system. Through the 72,000 nadis, the channels in the body. So, that is the fourth factor of action, the pran. Without pran, there's no kriya, no activity. So then, the fifth one. Daivam chayvatrapanchamam. And the fifth one here is daivam. That means paramatma. Paramatma. Here daiva means paramatma, the super soul. So, when these five factors are present, then an action can take place. Without them, you cannot act. So it's important to understand that the last one is Paramatma. He permits everything. In chapter 13, verse 23 of Bhagavad Gita. 13, 23. Upadrasta, upamanta, cha, barta, bhokta, maheshwara. Paramatma iti chaptu to deismin purusha para. After describing about the soul, Krishna said, Dehis men purushapara. There's another purush in this body. Dehis men purushapara. There's not only one purush, the soul, but there's another purush who lives in this body. Who is that? Paramatmeiti chaptukto. He is called Paramatma. And what is the role of that Paramatma? Upadrasta means his shakshi, watching. He's watching, but he's not getting involved. Paramatma is just watching. But he's also Upamanta, Anumanta, sorry. Upadrasta Anumanta. That means he's permitting. If Paramatma will not permit something to take place, it cannot take place. Because he is the he is the Vastu. He is the substrate of all existence. He is the actual reality. Dharma Padita Kaita Votra Paramone Matsaranam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Shivadam Tapa Trayunmulanam. In the beginning of Bhagavatam, Silabhyasa Dev said, This Srimad Bhagavatam reveals that which should be known. The Vastava Vastu, the Vastava factual Vastu substance, the factual substance of reality everywhere. Only Paramatma. Mm -hmm. And knowing that, Shivadam Tapa Trayon Mulanam, to know, to see Paramatma everywhere, this is very auspicious because it uproots Tapatrai, all the threefold miseries of material existence. Until one knows, until one sees the Supreme Lord everywhere. He must undergo threefold miseries. So Vedam Vastava Matravastu Shivadam Tapa Trayonmula. There's only one way to uproot the miseries of material existence, and that is to know the Vastu, the, the true substance of reality. Paramatma. So these are the five factors of action. So we have this situation where, let's look at different situations. The conditioned living entity who is completely in ignorance, he has potentially he has some free will, but is not manifest. Because he does not know the alternative to sense gratification. Right? He's completely in ignorance. He's just thinking, what can I eat? Eating, sleeping, mating and defending. Like this. He cannot understand anything. Someone in the mode of passion also 
It's very passionate, but they may meet a sadhu. Even someone in the mode of ignorance can. They also, no one's fully in ignorance. There has to be some righteous there just to be able to get out of bed, to move. So, if someone meets a sadhu, and the sadhu said, you are a soul and you are the servant of God. Now, he has an option. What do I do? Serve myself or try to serve God? But when he's very, very conditioned, it's difficult to serve God. Because all the senses are saying, don't do that devotional service. Engage, do karmas in this world. Hmm? The mind is buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. I want to do an activity that will get something for myself. A reward-seeking activity. This is the mode of passion. I will only act to get something for myself. What is this devotional service? I went to the temple, I cleaned the floor. I cut the vegetables. I washed the pots. Hmm? And at the end, I had nothing to show for it. Hmm? Because bhakti is a way to keep. It is performed with, without a cause. It is not done for a purpose other than to please Krishna. So the rajasic mind, which is always reward seeking, does not want to do bhakti because the rajasic mind will not do anything unless there's something in it for his conventional empirical self, which is not himself. Really, it's just the material ego. Huh? So in bhakti, then what do you get from this? So one who is very rajasic will not engage in devotional service. They will seek every excuse to avoid devotional service. Even if they put on tilak and kantimala and have a japamala and sit Hare Krishna Hare. But in his mind he's thinking about worldly activities. Hmm? Because he just cannot think. I should do this, chant the holy name, to please Krishna. That's all. But if he hears and has association, now he has a choice. But it's difficult. Rajas makes things difficult. So the degree to which Rajas, that is the Avidya Vritti of Maya, goes away, the degree to which Rajas is going away, and the degree to which Sattva comes, that is the Vidya Vritti of Maya, then to that degree, the person will have more freedom to make better choices. <laughs> At least the sattvic person, his senses are not disturbing him to the point where they're taking their, he's feeling a strong pull away from devotional service. So by practicing bhakti, one goes up. Tadara jastamo bhava kamala bhadeyaste cheta eta anavidam stitam sattve prasiddhati. Practicing bhakti, gradually tamas goes away, rajas goes away. Lust and anger and greed, they gradually go away, one becomes in sattva gun, and then in the sattvic chitta, he begins to realize the Vishuddha sattva surup. There's a reflection of Krishna's Vishuddha sattva surup in his sattvic chitta. And so, now he can, he can express his independence. Now, so we have discussed the various nuances of Gyatritva. We have just discussed the various nuances of Kartritva agency. Now we come to the subject of Bhoktritva. Uh, in that the Jiva is an enjoyer. Bhagavad Gita. 1321. Bhagavad Gita 1321. There Krishna said, Karya Karna Kartri Tve Heitu Prakriti Uchate Purusha Sukha Dukanam Bhakti Tve Heitu Uchate Here Bhakti Tva So the meaning is this Prakriti Heitu Prakriti Uchate Prakriti is called the cause of karya, that means in this context the physical body, karana, the senses, kartritve, here means the material ego, which initiates 
the worldly activities. So prakriti is the cause of the body, the senses, and the material ego, which is with the mm, sense of I invested in it by the soul, is now initiating worldly activities according to karma. Okay? But purusha sukadukanam bhaktitve hetu uchate. But the purush is called is the cause hetu of bhaktitva enjoyment of what the experience bhaktitva the experience of suk and duk happiness and distress. Now. Deliberate on this very deeply. We discussed yesterday one of the qualities of the Atma is Chidanandatmaka. He is joyful. That means Dukkha Prati Yogita. There's no misery at all in the soul. And just an experience of the soul for a moment. We have a little glimpse of it in deep sleep, so we become refreshed. And we gave other examples also yesterday. So, happiness and distress is not in the Atma. Because the material happiness is always mixed. There's always some distress in with the material happiness. And in the suffering, it's mainly suffering. So there's Suk and Duk, but it's all mixed together in this world. This happiness and distress is actually not in the Jiva. It's in the mind. Hmm? If you're feeling any distress or anything, it's not you. Understand? Hmm? So you can look and think, oh, everyone is suffering, everyone is suffering. But actually, no suffering is there in the Atmos. It's only in the mind. There's no suffering in the Atmos. But because the Atma, by his Gyanriti, is investing his sense of I into the, the subtle body, and the subtle body is expanding and contracting, so he's thinking that I am suffering and enjoying. Actually not. The Atma is immutable and it is, does not uh, experience, it is not the location of the Sukh and Dukh. The word Ka means Akash, space. And Su means beautiful or good. Good space, that means that the, the Chitta is expanding. Sukha, the chitta has expanded in space. You can tell when you ex you feel happy, then it's as if your mind has expanded. There's a ullas, there's expansion of your consciousness. And when you're suffering, it's like you're just the mind is contracted. So dukkha means do means negative or bad. So dukkha, the mind has the chitta has contracted in space. So happiness and distress is nothing except for the chitta expanding and contracting. That's all. This is the, the illusion of the material world. Everyone's looking for happiness and trying to avoid distress. But they have nothing to do with this. It's only the chitta expanding and contracting. So sukha, good space, dukkha, bad space. But the purusha is the cause of him enjoying and suffering. Why? Because he's the cause, by his will, he has invested his sense of I in the subtle body, in the ahankar. And therefore, Krishna is saying here, the soul is the cause of bhakti, to tasting, experiencing, enjoying the suk and duke of this world. So in conclusion, Gyatitta, Katitta, Bhaktitta, Nija, Dharmaka, the soul has these three qualities of knowership, doership, and enjoyership. 
After hearing this Tattva from the lips of Sri Guru, then one should not be involved in happiness and distress. Mood swings. Hmm? Not my best day today. <laughs> hmm? One should not be involved in complaining, blaming other people, criticizing, being miserable. No more problems at all. This is the purpose of hearing Tattva hmm? That one will become free from all pro Atma is already free from all problems. But only due to ignorance. And then what happens? Only talking all the time. This problem, that problem, this problem, that problem. That problem. So one, this is the sign of one who has heard. Remember we began the class yesterday. Arjun said, Stita di kim prabhaseta. How does one whose consciousness is fixed, who is in Samadhi, how does he speak? And Krishna said, Yaha sarvatta no vishnehas tattat prapya shubha shubham nabhi nandati nadvaisti tasya prakya pratistita How does he speak? In this life, there are always upheavals. And whether the person gets something good or something bad, they don't blame, they don't criticize, and they don't also praise the worldly situations. So this was Krishna's answer. How does the person who is stita deep, how does he speak? So this, by these words, this is a barometer, a barometer by which we can measure in our own life. Have I heard? the message from the, of the Vedas, from the lotus lips of Sri Guru, or not. So one who has heard Srotriyam will become Brahmanishta. That's fixed in devotional service to Sri Krishna. So, from today, no more problems. If you come to me with any problem, I said, did you not listen? <laughs> now, oh, let's let's touch on the next two lines of this. Yeah, we can move. Paramat Maik no, Paramat Maik ashe shatwa, subhava sabada sota. The jiva is Subhava Sarvada, always situated in his own nature. And who is he? He is Paramat Maika He is the Parikar. He is the associate of Paramatma. Just like Krishna in Vrindavan has his Parikars, his associates there. Narayan in Vaikuntha has his associates there. So in the Shristi Leela, the creation pastime, which is done by the Paramatma, guess who his associates are? It's you. Yes. The Jeevas are the associates of Paramatma in the Leela called Shristi Leela. Creation pastime. <coughs> so also in Bhakti Sandarabha in the beginning, Sila Jiva Goswami said, Paramatma Vaibhava, the Jiva is the Vaibhav. That means he's the manifestation of the glory of Paramatma. So that's who we are. So Paramatma Ikashe Satwa, we are the Parikas of Paramatma. Well, that has many implications. For example, the Paramatma, Kirdakishai Vishnu, is he in Goloka Vrindavan? So, being as you are his associate in his Leela, have you ever been in Goloka Vrindavan? No. No. 
Some persons think that the jivas fallen from the spiritual world. But directly in Shastra here, it is said, Paramat Maika Sheshatva, that the jiva is the Sheshatva, that he is the, the conscious being uh, manifest as the associate of Paramatma. So Paramat Maika Sheshatva, we are in the Shushti Lila. We have never been in Veloka Vrindavan, but we have the possibility by Sadhu Sangha to develop pure bhakti and receive a very beautiful transcendental spiritual swarup in Radha Krishna's eternal pastimes by the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his Brahma. Now, let's, we, have, we still have some time. Let's see. You can? The first. No. Roll the whole thing over, everything. Yeah, yeah. Because there are three, yeah. All the way over to the last one. So now, we have completed for today the discussion of the first aspect of Brahm, illusion, related to one's own identity. Now we are coming to the topic that is we are Ketraka, the knower of the field. Now we come to the subject of Brahm, illusion in relation to the field. What we are seeing. The world. So this is amazing explanation given by Narad Muni. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, Chapter 15, entitled, Instructions for Civilized Human Beings. <laughs> so you all very civilized human beings. So these are instructions for <laughs> So, Narad Muni here, will completely deconstruct bodily consciousness and the, he will pinpoint, identify the essential mistake in our experience of the world or our essential mistake in our non-experience of Paramatma everywhere. So let's look at the first. first. Abhaditopi ya baso Yathavastu tayasmitaha Durkatatvad aindriyakam Tadvad artha vikalupitam So the meaning is that just as a reflection is envisioned as an independent, a real independent substance, despite the fact that that is disproven logically. In the same way, the objects of this world which are perceived by the senses are only imagined to be independent realities. Now, what does that mean? For example, if someone shines a light on the wall in a shape or something then a child may look at that someone who has the balya buddhi balya buddhi childish intelligence can look at that and think oh there's something on the wall hmm? actually what he's seeing exists but it has no independent existence from the light source but the child is looking at the movement of the shadows or the shape on the wall and thinking this is the reality. So Bhagavatam is of course eternal. It was written down 5,000 years ago. But centuries and centuries after that, Socrates has given the same instruction to Plato. You know? It's, it's very famous, Plato's cave analogy that there were some persons, they were imprisoned, they were chained in a dark cave facing a wall and behind them there was a light 
and when things moved uh, in front of that light, it cast shadows on the wall, and they were looking at this. This is all they know, and they thought these shadows are reality. Then one day, someone escaped and went outside, and they saw the real world. And he came back in and told the people in the cave, this is not the real world. I'll take off your chains. Come with me outside. There's another world. And said, you're mad. You must be crazy. Leave us alone. This is the real world. We can't take off these chains. How will we stand up? So persons who have seen the truth, they understand. The persons who have not seen the truth often think that the persons who have seen the truth are mad and persecute them. So that's why there are so many martyrs in, in spiritual life. Haridas Thakur was beaten in so many marketplaces. Jesus Christ was, and so many saints were martyred. So, uh, this, uh, this is a very well-known example, the cave, Plato's cave. But where does this idea originate from? Srimad Bhagavatam. So it's described here. That's Hiya Baso. Abbas means a reflection. Yata vastu taya smrta. Smrta means that the person in his mind, he thinks that the reflection is the true substance. Hmm? And that the true substance is independent. Hmm? It is existing by itself. Not that it's dependent on the existence of the light source from which it's coming from. So, here he said, Tatva. In the same way, oh, no. Let me, let's just come back, sorry, to the word abadito. Abadita means tarkavirod. It is tarkavirod, against reason. So abadito piyabiyaso, even though it's against reason to think that a reflection exists independently of its source. Mm -hmm. And then this, this is a real substance. Even though it is Abhadita, it is Tarkavirod. It is against all reason. But still, Vastu Tayasmrtaha, one who has a childish intelligence, will see that which is not independent as an independent existence. Mm -hmm. Now, how does that relate to us in this world? Tadvad, in the same way, Aindriyakam. The objects of the senses, the things we are perceiving around us in this world, Arta Vikalpitam. Vikalpitam means it is speculated or it is imagined that they are Arta. That means that they are a real Vastu, a valuable, independent, self existing entity. Durga hmm? uh, uh, Even though uh, it's impossible to prove. You cannot logically establish that uh, anything in this world is uh, self-existent. So that's the meaning. The meaning of the verse. Now, let's apply this. Now, Narayana is going to apply this in the next verse. You can roll the next verse. Chityadi nami hapa nam chaya na katama pihi na sangato vikaro pi na pritang nam bito marisha. In the previous verse, he said, Dogata tuad. You cannot logically establish that something is self existent, an independent, um, individual self existent unit. You can't establish it logically. But we think like that all the time. That's how we think. For example, if you have whatever it is, here's a, a, wooden, a wooden book stand, right? It's just there, right? It's a vastu. Isn't it a vastu? Isn't this a real substance? Huh? Seems like. So. <laughs> Now we, we do this, we do this naturally. Everyone does it without thinking. 
In this verse, on the second line, you see the word chaya. Chaya means, the general meaning is a shadow, but here it means a mental representation. In other words, when you see something, in your mind you have a mental representation of it as it's just there, it's just existing by itself. Hmm? Where's God? There's no God. Where's the proof of God? Everything is just existing. Here it is. The table, the chair, the bottle. They're just all... So you understand? You have in your mind a chaya. That means a mental representation of every object. And you're just... They're existing by themselves. No one's doing it. Right? But this is not a fact. Just like, let's say, if someone is playing music with a violin. You can hear the music, but when they stop playing the violin, the music disappears. So, existence is only God's music. If God were not making everything exist, it would not, at every moment, it would not exist. But we have a chaya, a mental representation in our mind, that this bottle, this table, this chair, they're just independently and individually self-existent by themselves. And then, we ask, then people have this question, where is God? Is, is there a God or not? Yeah. So, in the previous verse, Naradri, she said, Durga Tattvat, because you cannot logically prove that anything is just existing by itself, independently of its uh, components, its component elements. Therefore, uh, it's, this, is, this idea itself is a Brahman. It's a big mistake. It's an illusion. So now in this verse, Narad Rishi will explain why you cannot logically prove that anything exists as an as independent, self-existent object. He'll explain that now. So he's saying, Chityadi nami hatanam. Hatanam means there are various objects in the world, and what are they made of? Chityadi nam. Chiti means earth. So earth, water, fire, air, ether. We can see objects around us, and they're made of the different elements. Now, what is the relationship between the elements, the component elements of an object, and the object? itself. In other words, the representation of the object that you have in your mind. Hmm? You say, here's a bottle. Here's a bottle, right? Huh? It's just existing there by itself. But you know that this bottle is made of certain elements. There's some earth element in there, maybe some water, fine. All the elements, different elements are there in, a, in, in an object. Now what's the relationship between the component elements and this whole thing that you are calling the bottle, which you have in your mind, that chaya, that mental representation of a whole thing. What is the relation between the whole and the component parts? Now, Nayad Rishi will cut one by one every possibility. So first he said, Na Sangato, you can see in the third line, Na Sangato. Sangat means an aggregate. An aggregate means that the, the component parts are just together, next to each other, but they're not, they have, they're not related actually. Just like, have you ever seen a forest? You've seen a forest, right? Really? You have in your mind a chaya, a mental representation that there's this whole thing which is called a forest. But when you actually get there, you see that it's actually all individual trees. Right? From far away you thought it was one thing, a forest. And you have that chaya in your mind, that mental representation. But the fact of the matter is, it is actually a sangat. It's an aggregate of trees. Hmm? Because you can grab one tree and pull it. And you uproot the tree and you take it somewhere, but the forest is still there. Right? 
So what you call in the forest, this is a chaya, this is just a metal representation in your mind. Mm -hmm. So, Buddhists, they say that nothing is really meaningful. Mm -hmm. To see things as individual objects, this is not meaningful because everything is just a chaya. It's just a, um, an aggregate of the elements. So, now, Narad Muni is speaking this in relation to our body. Consider your body. Because we've already discussed that we're not the body, we're the soul. So now this body becomes the primary um, ketra, the primary field. Because the soul is the knower of the field, this body. Now this body is the body, a sangat, an aggregation of elements, So Narad Muni is saying, na sangato, no, it cannot, because if it, if it were just a, a, an aggregate of elements, then you could just take one, one part of the body, just pull it, hmm? and just like you take the tree, you pull it, and the forest stays there, and the bit that you take goes over there. But if someone catches your finger and pulls, right, then your whole body will come. So it's not a sangat like a forest. Hmm? It's not the, the body is not a sangat, so we can reject the Buddhist idea. Like a Buddhist would say, there's no such thing as a pot. It's just lots of little atoms, all together in a particular arrangement, doing one function of holding water. But actually, it's just a, it's just a sangat. If you zoom in, it's just nothing is connected with anything else, like a forest. Okay, but in relation to our body, we cannot say that. Because if you take a part of the body and you pull, then the, the whole thing comes. So this this must be another relationship. So then Narad Muni is saying, Na sangato vikaro pi. Is the body a vikar? That means a compound of the elements. You see, let's say in chemistry, you get one element and another one, and you mix them together and they make a compound. And this compound is a new substance. It's neither this or this, but they came together and transformed and made something new. So in, in uh, Nyai, the logicians, their phrase is called Arambavad. That the elements come together and make something new. Okay? Nadja. So, is the body, the whole, something new that comes about by the combination of elements. Or here api, vikaro api. Here api also means tra is means transformation. Or do the elements not compounding with each other but stay as they are, transform and make the body. So Narguni is saying, na pratan nan me No. It, 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 this is not true. And to establish this, we have to examine what is the relationship between the parts of the body and the mental representation you have in your mind that your body is a whole thing. This is what we're challenging here. Or rather, Narad Muni is challenging. He's teaching you this, dear Maharaj. You are thinking, I have a body. Here it is. It's a whole thing. It's an individual, uh, isolated object which is existing by itself. It is a self-existing object, just like this mm, bottle or a wooden book stand is just there existing. So my body is also it's existing by itself and it's a whole, it's a one, one unit. So. This mental representation we have as the body being a whole, well, what relationship does that have with the component parts, the elements? So, Narad Muni says, you have to ask this question. Is this body, this whole body, one with the component elements, or is it uh, different from the component elements? So, if you see, first he says, Na Pritam. No, na, na pritan means it's the, it, it cannot be different from its component elements. Because if you start to take away the elements of your body, you cannot separate them. 
right? So take away one part, another there's not. Um, like a cross. If you have a cross, and if you ask someone, is the thread in the cloth or is the cloth in the thread? Right? Here's a piece of cloth. Is the thread in the cloth or not? If the thread is in the cloth, then you take the thread out and the cloth will be there and you can put it back into the cloth. <laughs> when you take away the thread, it's not cloth. <laughs> Only in your, this is what the meaning of chaya is here. Chaya is you have a mental representation that there's this whole thing which is different from its parts. There are parts and that whole thing is the shelter of its parts. But when you take away the, the uh, thread, then there's no cloth. So you do you have only a mental representation of this being a whole thing that exists independently from its parts. So, we cannot say that the body as a whole it exists independently of its component parts. It's agreed, right? All it is, it's just a collection of elements are there. Hmm? Now, if it's not, if the whole does not exist separately from the parts, then the whole must exist in the parts. Right? The cloth exists in the thread. Hmm? But the problem with this is that if the whole exists in the parts, does it exist fully in each part or does it exist only partially in each part? So, if this idea we have that our body is a whole independent thing exists fully in each part, then the finger would be the whole body. If you touch the finger, you would have touched the whole body. If you saw the finger, you would have seen the whole body. But it's not true. So then you think, well, the, we have this idea, the chaya, that the body is a one whole independent self-existent unit and it's, ex it's existing partially in each part. But that is not also possible. Because the whole and the parts. Now the whole is whole and the parts are parts. So for the whole to exist in the parts, it will need another set of non-constituent parts to inhabit them. It's a little... Yeah, yeah, I'll say that one more time. In your mind, you have a chaya, a representative. This is my body, it's a whole thing. Right? But you know, your body is constituted of parts, earth, water, fire, air, and so on. So does this, this whole is not different. It must... Then you're thinking now the whole exists in the parts. But the problem is this. The parts are there and the whole is whole. So how can it exist in them? The only way that it could exist in them is that whole must have another set of parts, not the constituent ones, to exist in, the, in those parts, to pervade it. But then it raises the question, what's the relationship between the non-constituent parts and the whole? And then, is it one with it or different? Then you need another set of non-constituent parts. And, but then what's the relationship with those parts and all? You need another set, so it becomes uh, the infinite regression. So that is, that is called, uh, in logic, vicious regress. Infinite regression. It's a little bit. You have to hear deeply and meditate on it, do vichar, then you'll understand. So here, Narada Rishi is basically saying that we've just proven that there's no such thing as the whole. The chaya of the body being a whole thing is, it's all impossible. So, in the previous verse, Durgavattat, Aindriya Kam, with objects that we see in this world and with our own body, logically we cannot establish that these are whole independent units. There are only parts there. Hmm? But it's not a Sangat. We've proven that it cannot be a Sangat. So now we have such a difficulty. Okay, let's say that the whole is just a projection of the mind, just like we were saying, the cloth is just threads, actually. But we have an idea. 
So our body as a whole independent unit is just an idea. Hmm? So yesterday you learned that you're not the body. And today you learn even your body is not the body. <laughs> this idea that your body is a whole independent unit is just a chaya. It's vikalpitam. It's just an idea in your mind. There are a number of reasons. Krishna gives other reasons. For example, in the 11th canto, also. He said that it's like looking at a flame. So you say, here's the flame. But actually the flame is thousands and thousands of reactions all going on. Very quickly, but it seems to make a consistent shape. And you say, this is the flame. But at any split second that you point to that flame, it's not the same flame. Hmm? And Krishna gives another example. A person looks and says, here's the river. Hmm? Where is this river you're talking about? Even the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, he was famous for saying that a man never puts his foot in the same river twice. Actually, you have water. It's raining, it's falling on the mountain and that water's flowing. So it's every second, it's a different... Let's just say there are atoms of water. It's a different atoms of water going past. Where's this river that you talk about? Where is it? It's a chaya. It's a mental representation in your mind. So the body is also like that. But every second, everything, food is going in, something's coming out, everything is changing, moving, like this. Yeah. So a person never puts his foot in the same river, twice. The idea of the river itself is a child mental representation. So you are not only not the body, but even your body in this sense is, there's no the body. Yeah. Right? Because there's only a flow. There's a flow of elements. The body, what is that? The is a single thing which has a, um, a stable existence. But here we're speaking about even the elements from which the body is made. Also, we cannot say that they're self-existent. So, in the first step, we showed how we have a mental representation in the mind of a chaya, of the body being an independent, self-existent whole. But when we looked at it closely, we found that this whole was only, that's a chaya, vikalpita, an imagination, and all you have is the parts, and those are the elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether. You just have the parts. So you agree, right? The whole is in your mind, but it's just, there are only parts. Okay. Now, these, the problem is this, that these parts, if you just look at one part, the part itself is a whole in relation to its parts. Digest. Would anyone like me to say that sentence one more time? Yes. <laughs> so then, in the next verse, Narad Muni is saying that, okay, you have a chaya, an idea in your mind that this body is one whole thing. But when you examine it, you found that the whole was just in your mind. And the, what you actually have is just all these parts, the different birds, water, of fire, air, ether. They're clumped together. But if you look at each part, each part itself is a whole in relation to its own parts, like Earth is made of atoms. Right? According to um, Nyai and Vaisheshik Darshan, it's made of atoms. According to Sankhya Darshan, the element of the uh, earth is made of the Tanmatras. You know, the Tanmatras, Shabda, Sparsha, Rupa, Rasaganda, combined together and make the element of earth. But in any way, you have this problem where the whole was only a chai representation in your mind, and you decided that, but it's just parts. But when you look at the parts, the parts are whole in relation to their own parts, so that also disappears as well. So, Narapun is saying, The word Mrisha means false. The idea of something being uh, a self-independent individual existence is only a chaya. In your mind, they're only the parts, but then when you look at the parts individually, they are whole related to their So that is, that's also false. And so, then the question comes is, well, what's really real? 
what is really real? So the answer is that The conclusion is that that which appears to be a single, we have this impression that there is a single unit, self-existent unit everywhere, is the actual Vastu, Paramahatma. Self-existent units don't exist. They have parts, but those are holes in relation to their parts. And their whole thing in relation to their parts. Dun, 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 dun. Even you get to the atom, the atom is also a creation of the mind. Avidya Maya Kalpita Stay in Srimad Bhaktam is also said. That is just a mental rep the atoms exist, it's just a mental representation. What actually exists? Paramatma. So in Srimad Bhagavatam it is said that. The Paramatma enters through his Kala Shakti, his feature as time, he enters into the mature elements and transforms them to make all the forms. And so the forms are like a shadow and the Vastu is Paramatma. So you remember, if you're looking at the world and thinking, oh this is this person, this is this person, this is this table, this is this chair, everything. You are like the child looking at the reflection on the wall, thinking, oh this is self-existent. And when the consciousness is purified, then you realize that the cause of all the forms and behind everything is the one Vastu, who is actually a Vastu, who is indivisible. He doesn't have, he's, there's no hole in parts. He's indivisible, he's akanda, advaya, tattva. And that is paramatma, everything. So, I'll give some little thought experiments for you just to help you hmm, assimilate it. In the Chattu Sloki Bhagavatam, the first verse of the Chattu Sloki Bhagavatam, Krishna said, Aham meva sameva gri nanyat sarasat param paschadaham yaditat cha yovasisheta sosmyaham before the creation, before cause and effect was manifest, only I existed, Krishna is saying. And at the end, when the universe is uh, dissolved, only I exist. And in the middle, only I exist. <laughs> that is the first verse of the Chattu Sloki Bhagavatam, giving some Bhanda Okay. So, just try to picture it for a moment. Just picture, picture this for a moment. Close your eyes for a moment. Okay, now put your uh, sense of I, take it out of the body and mind, and just keep it in yourself. Your soul. You're spiritual. You have no body, just your Atma. Now, before the creation, Krishna is saying, only I existed. So now, there's you and there's Krishna. There's no creation. So then, see Krishna, in the form of Paramatma, called, enters into his potential. Formless, pretend, the, the, the Prakriti is a formless uh, potential energy. But by the influence of Kal, the time Shakti, Paramatma, enters into that and causes that formless potential to transform and so these are all essentially forms of the Paramatma and the Paramatma becomes the planets becomes the earth becomes the, everything in it becomes all the people becomes all the bodies including everybody around you including your own body Paramatma has become everything. Now you as the Atma, you enter into one of those bodies. And now you're claiming, this one's mine. Hmm? Just like you can go to a city, you can go to a town with many tall buildings, 
you can walk up the stairs in one building to the top and you can look out and you see all the other buildings. So you're looking at the city from the vantage point of that one building. But you could come down from the building and go in another one and look from that vantage point. Hmm? You really have no connection with any of those buildings. None of them are you or anyone else. So in the same way, Paramatma has caused material energy to transform. Every, all the forms are his forms. And by karma, you have entered into one of those forms and you're looking from the perspective of that form. But the form is his. The form is his, not yours. He is the primary owner of this form. And you are just there for a moment, viewing the world from the perspective of that form. But the form is his form. <laughs> okay, you open your eyes now. <laughs> so now, actually what you're seeing is what I just told you about. Right? That was not a thought experiment or anything like that. That was what you're seeing right now. Understand? So, see Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita, that Bahu nam janmanan ante jnanavam mam prapadyate vasu deva sarvamiti sa mahatma sudulavaha after many births and deaths, when a person actually gets jnana, knowledge, he's not a muda, he's not Brahm in illusion anymore, then he surrenders to me. And what is the knowledge that he got? Vasu deva sarvamiti. There is Ketragya, the knower, the soul, and there is the, the field. But this field, everything is only the forms of Vasudeva Savamiti. So, not everyone will get it. Samahatma Sudurla Baha. Such a great soul is very, very rare. But, okay, so we are completing our discussion of the subject of what it means to be in Brahman, in illusion related to the self and to the world. Having heard this, knowledge, one should try to uh, live in accordance with that. And gradually by practicing sadhan, hearing from Guru, serving, chanting the holy name, this knowledge, it will manifest by itself as a result of bhakti. And Narada Muni and other rishis are describing it in Srimad Bhagavatam to confirm and to, um, for the Dridata, of your bhakti. So if you are following bhakti and you are starting to see the world in a very different way, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, then you are not going mad. It's like when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came back from Gaya, he said, he's gone mad. Mm -hmm. But when bhakti is manifesting and along with that divine knowledge, you are not going mad. So Narada Muni is explaining in detail uh, what this uh, uh, knowledge is in, in, in Srimad Bhagavatam. So, you can, this is opening the door to many different tattoos. Let, let me see what time, if we have time, I'll discuss one more tattoo. Okay, one more small tattoo. Is everyone, are you all on the same page? Did you follow so far? Yeah? Some of you are sweating. <laughs> Okay. So when you, I hope that when you opened your eyes, actually your eyes really opened. Oma jnana timurandasya jnana jnana salakaya chakshur militam jena tasmai shi gurave namaha So, um, you can roll it over to the last verse then. So then Narad Muni, He's saying, Satsa Drisha Brahmastava, Vikalpe Sati Vastuna, Jagratswa Poyata Sopnetata Vidin Ishedata. Narmuni is anticipating a question. So, the question he's anticipating is this You have just said, you this team, and you say to him, Oh, Narad. You have just said that all the forms around me, they're all Paramatma's forms. But we see that one form is a Brahmin, one is a Katriya and so on. 
And Brahmanas and Kattriyas, they have some vidhi and nishet, rules and regulations they have to follow in their life. If they follow them, then they get pious results. And if they don't follow them, if they transgress within the shade, rules and regulations, prohibitions, then they get impious results. But if these forms that we are seeing everywhere are forms of Paramatma, how can God, who is beyond duality, be subject to within the shade, the rules and regulations of the material existence and their reactions? Right? Does everyone... I'm about to give the answer, but you have to understand the question first. <laughs> Did everyone understand the question? Huh? I'll just say it one more time. If in the previous verses, we have learned that if all the forms around us, the bodies of every living thing, are actually the Paramatma's bodies. But we see one person has the form of a Katriya, one a warrior, one's a Brahmin, one is a Vaishya and so on, Brahmacharya, Sannyasis. So in Varnashram Dharma, there is Vidhi and the shade, some rules and prohibitions that have to be observed. So if you follow the rules, you get piety. If you transgress the rules, you get impiety and the reactions come, good or bad. So if the forms are Paramatma's forms, how can God who is Advaya, non-dual and transcendental, be subjected to the dualities of Vidya and Nishayit. How can Paramatma be under rules and regulations of this world? Just like it's just like as people say that uh, oh Krishna, I can worship Lord Ram. He's very well behaved, but not Krishna. Krishna's behavior is not good. How can he dance with other people's wives in the middle of the night? Huh? But they're not understanding this fact that God is beyond duality. He's not subject to the vidya and the shade of this world. So the morality related to this world, it does not apply to God. But now you're saying that all these forms are Paramatma's forms. So how can vidya and the shade be applied to the Paramatma? Hmm? So Narak Moon is giving the answer here. So he's saying, Syatsa Drishya Brahmasthavat Vikalpe Sati Vastu Naha Jagrat Swapo Yata Swapne Tata Vidhi Nishay Tataha. He said that as long as the soul which is in that body is has Sadrishya Brahma. Sadrishya. Sadrishya means seeing something as one, what we have discussed, that chaya, having a mental representation of one individual form. There's actually a, a, a technical word for it in Sanskrit. It is called Aikya Buddhi. Buddhi means consciousness, awareness, Aikya, that this is one individual object. Really, as we discussed, it's like the river, or it's like a flame, but we have Aikya Buddhi. This is one self-existent object. So that's called Aikya Buddhi. So, and also, when you have that Aikya Buddhi, that these, this is one, another, another, another individual self-existent unit, then you are thinking, it is called Swatantra Satayaha. Swatantra Sattayaha, that there is a multiplicity of self-existent forms. This form is existing by itself, this form is existing, this there's not a multiplicity, there's only one, Paramatma. There's one material energy. The Paramatma enters and causes it to transform. So what seems to be many, many, a multiplicity of self-existent forms is only one form, the Paramatma, causing the manifestation of apparently many forms, uh, uh, self-existent forms in the material energy. So that's called Swatantra Sattaya. We see like that. So when a person has the Dristi, the vision, that everything is individual self-existent forms, uh, that is called Sadrish, Sadrishya Brahm. So Tavat means as long as 
as long as the jiva in this body has this sadrishya brahm seeing the uh, self-existent individual forms svatantra satta as long as that vikalpa vikalpa sati vastuna by vikalpa he thinks that they are the vastu the truth hmm? then the tata vidi nishedata for that amount of time the rules and regulations are applicable to that body understand so as long as you are you have this sadrishya brahm not seeing the paramatma everywhere rules and regulations though this body is one form of paramatma but the rules and regulations are applicable to that body for that for that individual though paramatma himself is never in the duality so how paramatma is not in the duality but the person who is the paramatma is accompanying is in duality is explained in the third line it, it, it means swapne means in a dream right so in a dream jagrat swapo there is wakefulness and dreaming now what does that mean it means this imagine that you're having a dream but in your dream you dream sometimes that you're awake and sometimes you dream that you're asleep understand so you're just having a dream but in that dream you, you dream that you were walking around then you dream that you took rest and then you dream that you woke up but that was all a dream so you're lying on your bed but in your dream you think you're somewhere else in that somewhere else you're sometimes sleeping and sometimes awake right now the paramatma sees it like mm, the a person another person would be seeing you the paramatma sees oh he's dreaming hmm? but you are you are thinking i'm awake sometimes awake and sometimes asleep so for you there's duality but there's not duality for him hmm? For the Paramatma, the Paramatma, let's say if you see someone sleeping, you're just saying, he's just sleeping. So that's one thing. But for the person who's sleeping, he's thinking, sometimes I'm awake and sometimes I'm asleep. You see? So for him, there's duality. So in the same way, for the Paramatma, there's no duality. But for the, the conditioned soul who has Sadrishya Brahma, the vision of uh, individual self-independent units, as long as he has uh, that vision he he's in duality and the rules within the shade the rules and regulations of shastra apply to him now what would happen if that soul became free from sadrishya brahm krishna said in bhagavad gita yo mam pasyati sarvatra sarvam chamai pasyati tasya hamna pranasyami satanema pranasyati for one who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me, I am never lost to him and he is never lost to me. So what if a person becomes like that? Free from Sadrishya Brahm. Now that person is no longer subject to Vidhinishayad. So Jagratswa Pohyata Sopneitata Vidhinishayadataha. A person who is free from the duality free from Brahm related to himself and Sadrishya Brahm related to the body and to the other objects of the world he is also no longer subject to Vidhi and Nishayit rules and regulations so therefore he said Atmaramas Chamunayo Nigranta what does Nigranta mean? Free from the knot of, of, of ego, that's one meaning. And? Free from the grantas, which are the rules in this field. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Rasik Shekhar. <laughs> granta, granta means the scriptures are called Grantas. Right? Scriptures are called Granta. So, when one becomes free from this Brahm, 
then he becomes Atmarama Chamunio Granta. He's not bound by the rules and regulations of the scripture. So let's take it, take it in this way. The body is whose body? It is Paramatma's form. But the Paramatma will conduct this body in such a way that it is subject to rules and regulations as long as the soul there Satsa Drishya Brahmas Tavad as long as that soul has the Sadrishya Brahm the perception of self-independent units everywhere huh? now if that person becomes free from Sadrishya Brahm becomes free from illusion now that body which is one form of the Paramatma no longer acts or rather no longer permits that soul to act all controlled by the uh, Vidya Nishet. Now Paramatma himself, hmm? his, that body is not acting like a conditioned soul anymore. Now that's the, that uh, soul, that body, sorry, is a direct manifestation in this world of Paramatma. Jive Sakshat Nahitati Guru Chaitya Rupe Shiksha Guru Hoye Krishna Mahanta Swarupe so Krishna said, though the conditioned soul cannot see the Paramatma in his heart, therefore to help him, he comes outside in the form of Shri Guru. Uddhavji, he says, O oh Krishna, the great transcendental poets, they cannot express the extent of their gratitude to you, even if they glorify you for the life of Lord Brahma for millions of years. Why? Because you are so kind that you appear in two forms you appear in two forms to guide them over all obstacles internally and externally internally as the antaryami paramatma and externally as the acharya acharyam mam vijaniyam Krishna said, I am the Acharya. So in this way, because the absolute truth is absolute, when you realize one part of one aspect of tattva, all the other tattvas begin to manifest. So by understanding the nature of Brahm, the removal of Brahm, in regard to the self and in regard to the world, then one realizes the presence of Paramatma everywhere and one is no longer under the control of the Vidhi and Nishet. General persons, the body is subject to Vidhi and Nishet, but one who has become enlightened is no longer. And so he becomes the external manifestation of the Paramatma in your heart. That is Sri Guru or pure Vaishnavas. So in this way, Nad Rishi is describing in a beautiful way a complete deconstruction of the bodily conception of life and also it lays the ground for the true understanding of Guru Tattva. Grant Raj It may seem as if you're going mad, but <laughs> it's actually everyone else is mad. Only the devotees are sane. So try to don't do, slip, don't slip into your old stereotyped, conditioned ways of thinking. Tatsvinvan supatham vicharna karo bhaktya vimuchennara 
Srimad Bhagavatam Puranam Amalam Yad Vaishnavanam Priyam Yasmin Paramansam Eka Paramam Jnanam Param Giyate Tatra Jnana Viraga Bhakti Saitam Naiskamya Mahaviskritam Tat Srinvan Supatam Vitarna Paro Bhaktya Vimut Chandra Srimad Bhagavatam is the perfect immaculate Purana it is very very dear to the Vaishnavas it contains the gyan, the knowledge, which is of the Paramahamsas. Hmm? And one should hear it, repeat it, and with, that means Tachin Van Supatan repeat it, Vicharanam. And one should deliberate upon it and assimilate it, that it becomes, you see, through the eyes of Srimad Bhagavatam. Then what will happen? Tachin Van Supatan Vicharana. Paro Bhakta Vimuchandara, then Bhakti will come and you will be liberated from this material existence and go to Goloka Vrindavan. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.